this is Josh White with JW Math Tutoring. Today's video is going to look at some of the hardest questions from the May 2024 Digital SAT Math section, uh, probably for modules one and two. So let's go ahead and take a look. But life is a dream the calculus could never predict. So this video is going to run through some of the uh, more difficult questions that appeared on the May 2024 uh, U.S. SAT. Uh, the math section, some of these I think are from module uh, 2B, but we don't know uh, exactly for sure. These are crowdsourced questions from Reddit, and I'm just going to go through them. Uh, keep in mind, I've tried to reproduce them as much you know, as possible, but obviously we don't have all the answer choices. So a lot of these are probably multiple choice, not free response, but I'm going to treat them as if they were uh, free response. So of course, if you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. And of course, uh, subscribe to my channel, sign up for notifications as well. All right, so the first one here. You're given that this function is in the form of, like, say, x minus a times x minus b, just means it's a quadratic function, okay, where a and b are your in, are integers, and you're also given this information, f of 11 greater than 0, f of 14 less than 0, f of 17 greater than 0. Okay, it says find a plus b. So, turns out there's multiple correct answers for this one, because if you just, like, say, sketch out a graph here, so... All the way over here where x is at 11, the y value is positive because the f of 11 is greater than 0. Then over here at 14, the y value is negative because it's less than 0. And then again over here at 17, the y value again turns to positive. So we don't know that like 14 is the vertex. We don't know the exact shape of this thing, but just whatever, you know, rough kind of sketch. So if you do something like this, notice the two zeros, the two x-intercepts have to be between 11 and 14, one right here, and the other between 14 and 17, okay, because the y value switch between those two sets of points. So one of these is A, the other one is B, it doesn't matter which one. So uh, you just pick any numbers here. So A could be 12 or 13. B could be 15 or 16. So it's any combination of those values added together. So you're looking at correct answers of like 27, 28, or 29, okay? Um, any or all of them uh, could be correct. And again, there's different tests have different numbers, obviously. So depending on, you know, whatever numbers, uh, if you took this test, whatever you were given for the X values, your answers could vary. But this is the basic idea, basic approach to this problem. All right, the next one was the geometry question. Um, and you're basically given this diagram with some overlapping triangles. And uh, so you're supposed to find this angle that's labeled X, you know, right up here at the top, basically angle A, B, C, right here. And I believe you're also told in the problem, at least you would need to know this in order to solve it, that A, B, and A, C are congruent. So those two sides um, are congruent. So now, all we have to do, and going on figuring this out, is, you know, use some basic properties of triangles and lines. So ADF, the angle next to this 43 degree angle here, is going to be 137, because you just subtract 180 minus 43. And then um, <clears throat> what you know is if you look at the big triangle here, AFD, okay, so that triangle, you've got... 25 plus 137 plus angle A equal to 180. So if you go ahead and you solve for that, you should get the measure of angle A comes out to 18 degrees. Then angle C down here also is 18 degrees. Why? Because they're across from congruent sides. So in a triangle, basically in an isosceles triangle, you know, you have two congruent sides, so therefore you also have two congruent angles. So now to get x, you can just add up 18 plus 18, um, and then plus x, or the measure of angle b, that's, me well, a, b, c, really, what we're solving for. Just call it x here. And that adds up to 180. So if you go ahead and do that, you're going to get, you know, 36 plus x equals 180. x is just going to be 144 degrees. Again, the numbers in the specific problem you may uh, have had would vary, but... Um, this is the basic approach to solve this overlapping triangle problem. All right, next. Here we have one with an exponential function. 
um, of this general form, basically a, b to the x over n, and you're told a and b and n are constants and also that they're all integers. That's another important thing. And you're given uh, some point values here. Basically, you know, 4 for x corresponds to 4 for y, and 7 for x corresponds to 108 for y. So there's multiple ways you could do this. If you were going to do this by hand, you would notice this is since this is an exponential function, basically you for each increase in 1 by the x, you multiply by some number for the y. But it's called the common ratio if you think about this as a geometric sequence. So in other words, to get from 4 to 5 and then to 6 and then to 7, you're going to add 1 three times. So that means you're going to do 4, you're going to multiply by some value, and then you're going to multiply by some value and multiply by some value. So overall, you're multiplying 4 by some number three times, x times x times x, let's say, or we could use a different letter if that's confusing, but, you know, you're multiplying by some value three times, which is the same as multiplying by that value cubed, and the result you get is 108. So what is the value you are multiplying by? Well, if you just solve this basic equation, divide both sides by 4, okay, we're going to get x cubed equal to, uh, let's see here, why am I not doing this off the top of my head? 28 divided by 4, oh, 27. And so x, is, then you cube root both sides, x is going to equal 3. So 3 is the number you multiply each y value by to get the next one. So if you just follow the pattern here, Okay, this is going to be 8, and this is going to be 9. So times 3 times 3. So you just do 108 times 3. That's going to be uh, 324. Again, of course, you would you know, probably do this um, in Desmos, not uh, you know, just on your head. And then um, after that, the next one, uh, 324 times 3 is just going to be 972. So f of 9 is just going to equal 972. Again, the numbers you used, uh, you may have seen a problem like this may vary, but this is the general approach. You know, basically, this number is going to be a multiple of this number by some factor. You know, in this case, it's by 3, and it's going to be multiplied you know, by the difference between these, meaning 7 minus 4 is 3. So that means you're going to multiply 4 by some number three times because of the 7 minus 4, and that gives you the 108. Now, here's how you could do this in Desmos, although the problem is it's not going to be quite exact. So um, if you go to Desmos and you create a table and you put some points in. All right, and then we will do an exponential regression. Now, the, the key with this one is you have to define a number for n. You can't just put in n because then there would be three variables but only two points and it won't be able to solve it. So for n, initially I'm going to choose 1, okay? And I should make this x1. Okay, so I do that. And now it gives me values down here. Now what you have to do is find, okay, what is, when x is 9 now, what is it equals function? So couple ways you could do it. You could type the line x equals 9, and then you basically have to zoom out and see where they intersect, but it's going to be a gigantic value, and it's really kind of difficult to tell. I mean, you can click along here, oh, and you can see right there that's the exact value. Um, what you Ideally, what you might want to do, too, is you could take those numbers now, and you could plug it in, and you could say 0 0.049323827 times 3 to the x is 9, uh, just divided by 1. Okay, and note, so notice it comes out to this, but if you're not sure if it's 971.999, whatever, versus 972, this is where you graph the x equals 9 line, and at least now you know where to look in the ballpark for the intersection. So now you would know to look at 972, and you can see it right here. Okay, so correct answer is 972. That's how you could do this one, um, you know, basically exclusively in Desmos. Next question, uh, for, we're going to look at number four here, the top one. So 
this one I don't have all the information for exactly. I think I tried to reproduce essentially what it's asking for. Um, because you, you have a triangle, you have these vertices. So if you plot these points out in Desmos, you'll see they form a right triangle. You know, 3, 2 would be like right here, 3, 6 would be right above it, and then 7, 2 would just be across from it. So these are the three original points, right? Right here forms a right triangle. Now, the other right triangle, or the, excuse me, the other triangle has a point of 3, 2. Okay, that's the same. And then 3, comma 2 plus k. So that means it's like 3, same x value, but it's like somewhere, you know, on this line here. It could be up here, could be down here, we don't know. Same thing, 7 plus k, comma 2. So that means it's on this line, but it could be here, could be here, could be here, we don't know. And so I think what it's asking for is it gave you the information that like in this triangle, one acute angle is equal to t, what's the measure of the other acute angle? So the correct answer is 90 minus t for this problem. And I believe the whole takeaway is, and this will be easy, much easier to see in Desmos, so if you plot these points uh, for the 3 comma 2 and then um, the other ones where we're just going to put in a slider, basically what you'll see is as you move the slider, even though the angles change, so here's our slider. Okay, let me jump back to center. Okay, so here's the three, here's the current points, right? So notice even as I move K, like the points slide along those, the horizontal and vertical lines, but it always forms a right triangle, which means that like the two angles, you know, formed here at the top and at the, like the top angle and the bottom right angle together add up to 90. In other words, you still have the right angle at where the purple dot is at the three comma two. Even if you go over here, see it flips the other direction, it doesn't matter. It's still a right angle at the purple dot and then the other two points together add up to 90. So I believe it's, that's, um, it's asking like, what are the other two angles, you know, what, like if one is T, what's the other one? Correct answer is gonna, uh, according to multiple people is 90 minus T. So I think it's asking for something like that, but again, not 100% sure because I did not see the actual question. All right, the, this question, uh, up next, number five, this is one of the most difficult questions, but it's actually not that difficult um, to do at all. So basically, you're given this expression, this polynomial, right? And it tells you it has a factor of r to the r z to the seventh plus q, where r and q are positive. You know, what's the maximum value of b? All right. So a couple things. First of all, all it's saying is if you factor this, that's what the r z z to the seventh plus q being a factor means. Just if you factor this, you know, into like this times this, um, with integers, like what's the largest b value you can get on the middle term? So a couple things, it completely ignore the fact that it's z to the 14th and z to the 7th. Um, that part is irrelevant. You can just change it, just if it makes it easier to think of, we can just make it like 38z squared or x squared plus bz, okay, plus 30. All right, so now <clears throat> if you think about factoring this, you know, the way factoring works, right? It's like z and z will go here. These are going to be plus, this is going to be plus. Okay, in front of the z's, you have the factors of 38. So whatever multiplies to give 38 is going to go in front of the z. And then whatever factors of 30 are, are going to go here at the end. You can try out like multiple different combinations for these values, but it turns out that like basically when you're doing factoring, the further apart you make the factors, the larger that the product becomes. So what I mean by that is we want to take 38 and one. We do not want closer factors like 19 and two. And for 30, we don't want close factors like five and six or even three and 10. We want instead one and 30, the furthest apart they could go. And what we want to do is put them in the positions such that basically the largest value here is going to multiply, the largest factor here is going to multiply by the largest factor here. And if you notice what happens now, you get 38 times 30 plus, and then in the inner terms, one times one. 
So it's just going to be 1140, which is 38 times 30, and then plus 1. So correct answer is 1141. The basic shortcut to do a problem like this, if you see the exact same problem, the, bar, the maximum value of b, it's just going to be equal to a times c plus 1. Okay, you're just going to take this number times this number right here and then add 1 to it because you're going to put those two numbers in like the first and the last position and then the two inner numbers will just have to be 1. So correct answer, 1141. All right, now uh, this next one, question 6, I will give you a warning. This question appears on practice test 6. Um, it is in the second module. It's one of the questions in the harder module towards the end. So if you have not taken practice test six yet, then maybe you want to ignore or skip this question just because, you know, you want to uh, get a score on that that would reflect, you know, what you know without having been exposed to end material on it. So if so, skip this question, move on to the next one. So this is a question where you basically have a circle. Okay, and then we have a center in the circle. All right, and that center is point G. And then we have two points on the circle, A and B here. What's going on? And then you also have a point out here. We'll call it point H. Okay, and AH is tangent to the circle. So that means that the line segment that connects A and H just touches the circle at one point. And the same thing is true for HB. Ignore uh, my poor drawing. Now, the radius of the circle is some given value. So notice, here's a radius. Here's a radius. OK. They also give you the total perimeter of this quadrilateral four-sided figure, and they want to know what's the distance between G and H. So in other words, this vertical line right here, what is the distance from this point of uh, tangency? Well, no, not a point of tangency, the intersection of the two tangent lines outside to the center. So all we have to do with this problem is a couple things. First, uh, property of geometry. When you have a line which is tangent to a circle, if you draw the radius to that point of tangency, it forms a right angle. So over here, right angle. Over here, right angle. That means that GH basically gives us two congruent uh, right triangles. Also, another property in geometry, um, AH will be congruent to BH because if you have two tangents to a circle that intersect at the same point outside the circle, Basically, the distance from that intersection point to the point of tangency, i.e. HA and HB, will be congruent. All right, so should label it like that. That tells you that if you take the 4,000 and you subtract off these two radii, which are 500 in total, you have 3,500 left to divide evenly between AH and BH. So that means each of these is 1750. Now you can just use Pythagorean theorem uh, to find GH, which is the hypotenuse. So, you know, we could just go to Desmos. And basically, we want the square root of 1750 squared plus 250 squared. All right, so the correct answer for this would probably be like 1768. Depending on how it's worded, it would probably say rounded to the nearest whole number or something like that. Or again, these are made numbers that I made up. These are not the exact numbers from the test um, that people posted. So again, your numbers may vary, but this is the basic approach, you know, that you would take to doing it and just use the Pythagorean theorem. And that's how you get GH um, that way. All right, next up, we have question number seven. So this one deals with uh, basically a set of data and <coughs> standard deviation. They give you the five values and they say, okay, if you add 90 to this set, will the standard deviation increase? So the answer is yes. You can get that theoretically or you can actually plug it into Desmos. So in terms of theory, I mean, basically the whole idea is, you know, think about standard deviation or whatever, and how far, you know, the values are spread out. Like, 
if you add 90 to this, that, I mean, you might be considered an outlier because notice it's larger, it's further apart from the mean, which is 65 right here, than any of the other values. So the standard deviation is obviously going to increase because this number is further away from the mean than any other number. I mean, 25 units away, where everything, there, you know, these two are each like 10 above, 10 below, 20 above, 20 below, um, and so on. So from a theoretical perspective, you should be able to see that or to reason that. However, if you're not sure, you can go to Desmos and you can check the standard deviation. Now, you can use this function. You want to use the dot P for a population. Um, not, not for the entire uh, thing. So if you enter in all the values here, there we go, no period. Okay, so here's the original standard deviation, 14.14 approximately. Now I add 90 to it, it goes up to 15.92. So okay, that just confirms, that's easy. So you can just go to Desmos, plug in the standard deviation function, which again, it's STDEVP. You wanna do it for population and then plug in the values with the 90, without the 90 and just uh, get the answer, which is going to be yes. Okay, next one, uh, we deal with a right cylinder. Okay, you're given the surface area of the cylinder. It's 360 pi. And you're also told the height of the cylinder is 11. All right, and it says the volume is equal to n pi. They want to know, well, what's the value of n, basically? In other words, how many pi is the volume for uh, the cylinder? Okay, so we're going to start off surface area for a cylinder, formula is 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h. The 2 pi r squared basically gets you the top and the bottom. And then the 2 pi r h is like the total area of the kind of the middle part, like if you unfolded it flat into a rectangle. So that's equal to 360 pi, because that's given. Now, we know h is 11. So we can plug that in. Couple things to simplify this before I solve it. Uh, first of all, so I got two pi r squared plus 22 pi r. Now, minus 360 pi equals zero. This is actually gonna be a quadratic. But what I'm gonna do is first, I'm gonna divide everything by pi. That's just gonna drop out. Also gonna divide everything by two, just to make the numbers a little smaller. So I got r squared now plus 11 r minus 180 equals zero. This you could factor, or um, you could just easily go to Desmos and get it that way. So we go ahead and graph it. Okay, x squared plus 11x minus 180. We're looking for the y-intercepts. What are the y-intercept values? Well, one is at nine and one is at negative 20. All right, so that means r equals nine or r equals negative 20. Of course, we discard the negative 20 because we don't want a negative radius value. So now we've got to figure out the volume of the cylinder based on uh, a radius of 9, height of 11. So, of course, volume for cylinder, pi r squared h. So now we can just plug in pi. We can plug in 9, square it, times 11. That's going to come out to 891 pi. Of course, remember, they're looking for just the n in front of the pi. So correct answer to this is going to be 891. All right, next question. Uh, here we have one that deals with a radical function. Again, it's got some constants in it, a and b. They give us one point. They give us information about a second point, but not the exact value. Which of the following must be true? Okay, so couple things here. Um, first, some theoretical stuff. Since you know that um, if you plug in negative 24 for x, okay, notice for that for it to equal 0, either a equals 0, which if a equals 0, then the whole thing would just be f of x equals 0, be a horizontal line. So that doesn't, that's, that's wrong. Or 
this whole expression equals zero. So you could technically square both sides, and then it would just be negative 24 plus b. So, and on the, so b has to equal 24. So that part we can actually uh, figure out right off the bat. So, all right, so we know the function at least minimally looks like this. So, um, you know, which of the following must be true? Well, first couple we can't really realize. A versus B, we can't um, tell exactly. It's easiest, honestly, just to go to Desmos and look at the graph of this, and that will help you eliminate um, all the answer choices to see which one is correct. So, what I would do is, uh, <clears throat> so a couple, so, if you wanted to just start with the um, thing that we have, so we got this, and we know the point. Actually, no, negative 24, 0 would help us. We need, okay, so now what I'm going to do is, sorry, I'm going to put in uh, something for the second point here. The f of 24 is less than 0. So I'm going to put in 24 for x. For y, I'm just going to put in any negative number, okay? doesn't matter. I'll just put in negative 20. So let me do this and do this. All right. Oh, I got to do it in the other order. Sorry, I got to put the table in first. Negative 20. Okay, now I can put in my regression. Okay, perfect. So here's my graph, here's my a value. Now, is f of 0 24? Uh, no, it's like negative, what is here, negative 14.2. So does that, must a be true? No. Um, is f of 0 because 24 would be up here in the positives? Is it negative 24? No, it's, like I said, negative 14.4. So the first two were gone. We found at least one example where neither is true. Now, what about a versus b? Well, we already know that b is 24. Okay, what about a? Negative 2.86, blah, blah, negative 2.9 approximately. So is negative 2.9 greater than 24 or less than 24? Obviously, it's less than 24. So you can get rid of all three of these. Correct answer is going to be letter D. Now, one thing I will point out too is that you can actually do this entire thing without, like, with B. Um, if you also enter in two points in the table. So in other words, you don't actually have to solve for B, you can have Desmos do that. So if I entered in two points here, one is the given point, one's the one I chose, and I just now put it in with both A and B, notice it finds A and it finds B, and then you can just easily compare them and of course rule out answer choices A and B as well. So you can do this entire problem in Desmos and just confirm that A is going to be less than B. The whole reason is because if it opens down, i.e. f of 24 is a negative value, that means the A in front of the radical has to be negative, okay, in order for it to flip down below the x-axis. All right, we've got two more questions we're going to take a look at here. So the next one is uh, one that involves a right triangle. Um, <clears throat> I think they also would need to tell you technically um, that uh, angle B is the, no, angle, yes, angle B is the right angle in the triangle um, as well. Okay, so here is the basic picture. You have triangle ABC, uh, B is the right angle, angle C is 35 degrees, BC right here is 26, so this has to be A, and they tell you the area of the triangle is equal to K tan 35, and they want you to find the value of K, you know, some number, some constant. All right, so there's multiple ways you could do this. Um, I think the quickest way, easiest way, is to basically find the area, uh, take the formula, okay, which is one half, base times height, that's going to be 1 half times the base, which is BC, 26, times the height, which is AB, and then set that equal to the K tan 35. 
Now, basically what's going to happen is tan 35 can be replaced. Here's the K. Okay. Tan 35 can be replaced with what it's equal to. So tan 35 is opposite over adjacent. So opposite the 35 would be side AB, because side AB is opposite angle C, and the adjacent would be side BC, which is 26. That's given in the problem. Now you can solve this out uh, for K. So you would get 13 AB equals K AB over 26. Um, if you wanted to multiply this across, you could get 338 AB equals K AB. So notice now, hopefully you notice K has to be 338 to make these the same, or you can just divide by AB on both sides and it drops out. So correct answer for this, K equals 338. Now, you could also technically um, basically do the following. You could, just to show you, it's, I mean, it's a little more work, but not, not really. It's just a different kind of way of thinking about this. You could also say, okay, I know that the tan of 35 equals AB over 26. So what is AB equal to? In other words, what's the value? Just use the tan ratio to get the value of that. So it's going to be 26 times tan 35. Okay, 12.32. 31, 9, below, whatever. All right, so now... The area of this triangle is equal to K tan 35. So now what you would do now is you would just technically like plug in all the values and set it equal, meaning you would do 1 half times 26 times 12.319 below whatever, and that's equal to K times uh, whatever the tangent of 35 is. And then you divide both sides by tan 35, divide by tan 35, and you should get 338, but the problem is it might not come out exactly. So notice that this 12 point through a 9, that is AB. So I want to get the area. I want to multiply this by BC, which is 26. And now I want to multiply. Hold on. Doing this one here. It's multiplying by the 35 angle. Okay, so multiply by 26, and now also times uh, 0.5. Okay, so 1 half. So that's the whole left side. And now divide essentially the whole thing by tan 35. So notice it comes out to 338, because the tan 35s actually cancel out here. Do you see that? And it's just 26 times 26 times 1 half. 338. So you can get it um, that way as well. Just a different way uh, to think about it. All right, last question. This is not a particularly uh, difficult one. I mean, it deals with lines, but still I thought it'd be a good one to go over. So uh, basically the question talked about a function f of x, which was 7 thirds x plus b. They don't give you the y-intercept, but they do tell you that the x-intercept of it is the point 13, 0. And they want to know the y-intercept of f of x plus 4. All right. Easiest way to do this is just go straight to Desmos. So we go to Desmos. I'm going to put in a table with that x-intercept point. I am going to do a linear regression with my 7 thirds x plus b. OK. The b value of the um, uh, of f of x is this value right here. Okay. Now what I have to do is I have to take f of x and I have to shift it to the um, left by four units. That's what the oh wait sorry I wrote that wrong. It's plus it's a plus four outside down here. Sorry. It's this. Get rid of that. It's shifted up four units, not to the left. It's not in parentheses. OK. So my new function is this. And actually, what I'm going to do, first, I just want to confirm. If I type enough threes here, 
Okay, it's negative 91 thirds. That's the B value as a fraction. So I'm just going to make, I'm going to do negative 91 thirds so I have the exact value, not, a, not rounded in any way. All right, so now I'm going to do my new function g of x, where I take f of x and I add 4 to it. Okay, so now I can get rid of um, f of x. Now, for, and I can get rid of it here, g of x. I want to know the y the y intercept. Okay, what's the y intercept? Well, it's down here, negative 26.33333. So you can put it in as negative 26.3. I think it would be 0.33 because you can have one, two, three, four, five, six spaces filled in when it's a negative value. Or you could also let me just see. Type, again, if you type enough of these, eventually, yeah, it'll give you, there we go, negative 79 thirds. So you could enter the value, oops, negative 79 uh, thirds that way as well. All right, so that was just a run through of 11 questions that were supposedly on the May 2024 uh, US based um, SAT math sections, um, probably somewhere on module one, but I assume most of these were on uh, module two. So any questions or comments, uh, if you took that test or whatever, you know, feel free to leave them below. I hope this helps you in uh, preparing for either this June SAT coming up or for, you know, other months in the future. Um, otherwise, of course, give this video a thumbs up if you liked it, subscribe to my channel and sign up for notifications as well.